We are entering, uh, this is what we call Palm Sunday, and we are entering the, what most people term as the Holy Week. It's holy in the sense that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, we'll read some scriptures in this just a little bit, man, they were just all excited about the king is risen up, and they're all excited about the king. By the end of the week, they're crucifying him. The resurrection of Jesus, which we'll celebrate next week, which is our Super Bowl, more people will come to church, and this is really, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, more people will come to church next Sunday morning specifically, but all we have our Saturday night with the exchange with Bill, Pastor Bill and Vicki, but more than any other time in, the, in, the, in, in mankind, you will see people come on that Sunday morning service across the world. They're here across the world, and we'll have two services on that 9 and 11, and so we believe we'll just fill up those services on Saturday night, and Kelsey will fill up their 1030 service. But I don't want us to miss the opportunity to reach out to people and to literally change lives. I was thinking about, um, I was texting several pastors this morning, and I went through and I, my list of pastors that I've texted, and I was kind of going through, and, and all of a sudden I went, oh, I've got to send that, that, and next thing I know, I've got 30, about 20, 30 pastors that I'm sending stuff to, and, and I was sending them a little a little excerpt today and then I got this sent back to me from one of the pastors he said this he says now listen this is so vital that we get this Christianity is not based on a philosophy or a teaching it is the only religion or the only religion based upon an event the resurrection Christianity is not based upon a teaching or a philosophy but it's the only religion based upon really one event and that is the resurrection think about this in the gospels you know we have the four gospels and the four gospels listen to the the how much time is spent in the four gospels dedicating themselves to this week the four gospels devote a great number of space in this important week in the that of christ and 28 percent of matthew think about this 28 percent of matthew talks about this week 35 percent of mark's gospel talks about this week 16% of Luke's gospel talks about this week, and listen to this, 43% of John's gospel is written about the last week of Jesus' life. How important is this last week of Jesus' life? In Mark's gospel, chapter 11, and verse 1, we have the story of him, what we call the triumphal in entry. It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives... Mount of Olives, if you look at Jerusalem, I was just there just a few months ago, but Jerusalem kind of sits up on this hill, and there's kind of a valley on the east side that goes down and comes up, and this is the Mount of Olives over here. So Jesus did, spent a lot of time over here in the Garden of Gethsemane and everything. When it, whenever you say that Jesus traveled a Sabbath day's journey to Jerusalem, or, or when you ever hear phrases like that, a Sabbath day's journey was just a short walk because they couldn't do any work on the Sabbath day, so it was a very short walk. So it's really just a short walk into Jerusalem from there, just maybe a few hundred yards, actually. It says, when they drew to, near to Jerusalem to Bethpage, uh, Mount of Olives, he sent his two disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you enter into it, you will find a colt tied, or a donkey, which no one has sat on. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, "Where are you? What are you doing?" This they say, "The Lord has need of it." And immediately he sent, um, he he will send it here. So they went their way, found the colt tied by the door outside the street, and loosed it. But some of those who were stood by said, "What are you doing, and loosing the colt?" And they spoke to them as Jesus had commanded. Commanded. So they let them go, and they brought the colt to Jerusalem or to Jesus, threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And those who went before him, or those who followed, cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Death, burial, and resurrection all took place in this week when they were praising Jesus. They were throwing down their coats, and they were throwing down palm leaves, and he was coming in, and See, the Jewish people, they thought that this week that, that the Messiah was coming. They looked at Jesus as the Messiah. Back then, a lot of the Jewish people looked at Jesus as the Messiah. 
and he's coming as the ruling king and now at that time they're under the Roman rule which Rome really controlled the whole um, area but when Rome took over an area what they allowed was they allowed their culture and their religion to continue so the Jewish people continued but they were under Roman rule and so they, he comes in and these people man Jesus is going to come and they're thinking he's going to come and he is going to kick the Romans rear end He's going to set up his kingdom and, and he's going to rule and reign and he's going to take care of all the oppression that we've been under and all this kind of stuff. And just a few days later, after he comes in there, he's dead. Can you imagine the sadness and the broken dreams that these people felt because they thought that this is things over with? And then, you know, of course, who believes that somebody's going to be raised from the dead in three days? But what's amazing about that, we'll probably talk about this next week. And I've got a message next week. I was driving home. I had a couple three-hour drive home this um, uh, yesterday, or excuse me, Friday. And boy, the Lord just dropped in me. I had a kind of a message plan, and I'm adding this to it. And I'm going to minister to people. If you bring people next week, I believe that th there's going to be some lives changed. Now, when you think about this, now Jesus is in his last week. Now think about this. And I'm just I'm covering a lot of content today because I want you to get this. Jesus is in his last week. So imagine you're, imagine you're about ready to pass in your life. Imagine, imagine you're on your, your deathbed. And Jesus knew he was going to be crucified, but, so he was coherent. But imagine that you knew that three weeks from today or one week from today, it's it for you. Think about this. Imagine that just one week from today, you're done. It's over with. Your life is over with. Man, I, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be thinking about your trip to Hawaii you were going to go on. I guarantee you, you wouldn't be thinking about, you know, well, I, want, I want to just buy one more car before I end my life. Now, you might want to drive a car fast or something like that, but you wouldn't be thinking about buying, well, maybe you wouldn't. Run up your credit cards, whatever you do. I don't know what you do. But at the end of your life, I'm thinking about the end of my life. I try to put myself in these stories, and I think about what, what would I want? If I knew I was going to die, what would I do? What would I do? Well, I can think of just a few things. I would probably gather, probably I would gather my son around me and, and maybe some young people. And I'd say, you got to know this. You have to know this subject. You, if there's one thing I can leave you, I want to emphasize something to you. I want to, I, I, if if I'm going to die and I've just got one week to live, I'm, I'm going to emphasize, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the most important thing that I can possibly tell you. I don't think I'm going to whisper to my son, 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 invest in that stock. Or don't forget, buy all the real estate you can get your hands on. I tell him that all the time now. <clears throat> but... But the reality is, at that time, what am I going to say? Well, Jesus, at the end of his life, in John chapter 13, was at the end of his life. Let's see what he told his disciples. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. So there he goes. This is John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end so he gathered his disciples around him and he's 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 instructing him i know i'm about ready to depart i'm i'm, I'm about ready to to end this man my my time is at hand i'm going to be crucified i'm going to be the savior of the world i got to tell you some things at supper they ended the devil having already put into the heart of judas iscariot simon's son to betray him jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things to his hands, that he had come to God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he had girded. Then came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, you're, you're washing my feet. Now, you have to understand that washing of feet, you, you have to understand now, Let's, let's get the picture here because this is so vitally important you get this before we read the rest of the, of the narrative here. Man, you know, you're going along there and, you know, you, 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 you might be wearing some sandals. You might be probably barefoot, but you might be wearing some sandals. 
Now, you know, us, you know, I'm trying to figure out what shoes I want to wear today and, you know, what color of shoes. And I went with brown this morning and all kinds of stuff. And, but they either had shoes or maybe a pair of sandals or maybe, maybe they probably didn't have shoes. And so they're walking down the streets that have just been traveled on by 43 horses and 12 donkeys. Now get the picture. Can you get the picture? Um, it wasn't like, ooh, 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 uh, ooh, ooh. You know, it's like, you know, there's just places that you went was, just places that you went, there was just a mess and your feet needed to be washed when you come into somebody's house. You guys have, you know, wipe your feet before you come in, right? A lot of us wipe your feet or we go, or you take off your shoes because you don't want to spread whatever's on the bottom of your shoes. Well, imagine that on your feet. It's the lowest form of, of servanthood that you can have i suppose if you were the least of the least of the servants your job would be to when some guests come in or the you know the child of the house comes in i'm sure that the first thing that they had to do was wash the feet of the disciples i remember a few church services where people would want to do a foot washing I'd always avoid those services i'm like no man we got shoes now i'm not doing foot washings anymore how many of you ever been to foot washing service? Yeah, some of you. Uh, did you ever survive it? I don't know how you did, but but here they are. This is the lowest, the lowest form of servanthood that you could possibly do, and Jesus does it to his disciples. Jesus then said to him, "What I'm doing, you do not understand, but you will know after this." Peter said to him, "You will never wash my feet." Jesus answered and said, "If I do not wash you," you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Peter always got his mouth out there, just something like that. Come on, let's just take a bath while we're at it. You're going to wash me? Just wash the whole thing, you know. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but it's completely clean, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew one would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So he when he washed their feet, taken their garments, sat down again, said to them, Do you not know that I have done to you? You call me teacher, Lord. You say, Well, for so I am. I fed, if I then, your Lord, and your teacher have washed your feet, you ought to have washed others' feet. For I have given you an example that you should do also as I have done to you. Mercy surely I say unto you, A servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent me. For you know the things that I bless you, and you are, and, and if you have do them. So here's Jesus. And the last thing before he dies, the last interesting thing, really the first part, and then mention some other things, but the last thing before he goes, he lowers himself to a servant, and he said, you you're going to follow me you got to do the same thing that that's huge we sometimes get in this christianity thing we we get into this christianity thing and we we think that uh somehow you know we we're, we can just kind of slide through without without being that servant but the reality is if you're going to do this christian thing right you got to be a servant you got to you got to be a servant you know, uh, Jesus did it, and then I was thinking about this, and, and, and think about some of the statistics of our area. You know, we whether we like it or not, we're in the city of Vancouver, Washington, but we're really Portland, Oregon, a bedroom community of Portland, Oregon. I mean, we don't even know what politics are happening in the state of Washington. We know what's happening in Oregon, because that's where the news comes out of, but we hardly even know what the politics are in the state of Washington. So these are kind of encompass us as far as these statistics. Listen to these. 29% of the people in Portland, Oregon are religious. So that means gather 100 people up, 70 of them are not religious at all. Remember the, uh, the statement, what's, what's Portland's uh, motto? Keep Portland weird. They're doing a good job of it. <laughs> meaning, they affiliate, meaning they affiliate with a religion, 7.9% are Catholic, 3.8% are LDS, Latter-day Saints, 9.24 are another Christian faith, 
only listen to this only 9.24 are churches like ours in all of the portland vancouver area isn't that amazing um 0.07 percent in portland oregon are jewish 0.11 percent are eastern faith and and almost zero islam people they don't even register in the in the in the uh, and ask a certain amount of people. Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, California, Washington, or Seattle, Washington, are tied in 2000, this is a 2015 statistic, list of the metropolitan areas with the most religiously unaffiliated, unaffiliated residents according to the nonpartisan, nonprofit, public religion research institute, American Values Atlas. A survey of 50,000 people, Seattle and San Francisco are more religiously unaffiliated people than the previous year at 33%, which Portland was less religious, unaffiliated residents than 2014, which was 42%. Las Vegas and Denver are next on the list with 29%. Remember, the church is made up of not buildings, but people. And I believe still, and I'll say this till the day I die, that the Northwest needs to unleash the body of Christ on the Northwest. I've never been so convinced that we need to do outreach like we never have before and reach people like we never have before. Um, the hope of the world is the church. I was thinking about this scripture, and I'm just giving you some statistics and some thoughts this morning because I want you to think differently. I mean, think about the, the, I want you to come back to that thing the, the week before Jesus died, the most important thing he says, you got to go serve. And then Mark chapter 5, I love this, this statement, and I'm going to tell you a little story. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians and she had spent all that she had was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said, if only I touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You remember the story there, the woman with the issue of blood, Mark chapter 5, and she was made well and all this kind of stuff and it was great. But, I, but here's a phrase in there that was interesting. He said, when she heard about Jesus, and I want to ask you this question, who told her? Who told her? Who told her? There was, a, there was a man that years and years ago, I think we were in the Tin Chapel over there, so we were talking a couple buildings, a couple, three buildings ago on 78th Street. We owned a, that little building there for a while. And there was a man that I was, uh, and I won't tell you his name, but some of you know who I'm talking about, but um, I was playing in a, alumni basketball game and I don't do that anymore because the last time I played basketball competitively I was at this thing and I was playing and I thought I'm going to go out and school these young boys and all I saw was chests and belts going on over here <laughs> and I went about that high and, there, and all I saw was like waist going right here I thought I am done playing basketball forever. But I played in a pickup game, and I had a pretty good game, and I had a bunch of rebounds. And one of the guys came up to me, and he said to me, he said, Johnson, what are you doing nowadays? And I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel, and I'm preaching at my own church. He looked at me and said, oh, my God. Really? You know? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. I told him where it was at. And he said, well, I'm going to come sometime. And I said, well, you know what? I'd love to have you come. And you're welcome to come. So one Sunday morning, I was in the foyer greeting people after the service. And I didn't realize, but that person and his wife were at that service. And they came to the service. And greeted. I said, well, you came. It's so good to see you. And they said, yeah, I, this is great. They said, you know, what? This is great. And I said, well, cool. I said, let's get together for coffee and he said okay let's get together for coffee I said this week I said I, it was I think that's what I think it was this week I said let's get together for coffee and I ended up spending a year of my life discipling that person we met in a restaurant every week discipling that person and they came to our church for a long time to go to another church now but he got saved his wife got saved and all of his kids got saved and they're serving God in a church today because somebody told him.
Now, I didn't feel obligated to say, you know, here's the four spiritual laws. Here's the, um, here's the, uh, the breakdown of Romans. Uh, I'm going to share with you all this kind of stuff. The only thing I did was say, I would love to have you come. I would love to have you come. And he said, well, I'll come. And he came. And to this day, I know there are pillars in a church in our community. There are a pillar in our church in the community. Because of just the encounter of, I'm not bragging on me. All I did was say, I'd love to have you come. And sometimes to change a life might be all you have to say is, I'd love to have you come. What if that was the only thing standing in the way of a neighbor, a friend, a somebody in your life, a coworker, or somebody else? What would that be if just, I'd love to have you come, was all you have to say. And, you know, we've got this new phrase. I think we're going to develop a campaign around it. We've got a seat for you. We'll, we'll get a seat. Listen to this. Years ago, Lifeway Research conducted a survey of 1,500 adults for the North American Mission Board to try to determine which of the 13 approaches to the gospel is the best received when a church wants to be heard. So, in other words, a church wants to reach their community. They want to reach out to their community. The research shows that shows us that based uh, uh, the best received means of seeing people walk into a church is well a personal invitation 67 listen to this 67 percent of americans say a, a personal invitation from a family member or a family member would be very or somewhat effective in getting them to visit a church 63 percent of americans say a personal invitation from a friend or a neighbor would be very or somewhat effective in visiting a church. 63% of Americans are very or somewhat willing to receive information about a local congregation or faith community from a family member. 56% of Americans are very or somewhat willing to receive information about a local congregation of faith community from a friend or neighbor. So uh, people are open to you and I want to see what this woman that heard about Jesus, who told her? Who told her? I submit to you, it's probably a friend or a family member that told her. And with the story, we preach on the story, we use the story, there's been books written about the story, probably because somebody told her. Somebody told me. I was a young 19-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid, almost 19. 18-year-old kid going somewhere, a train wreck going to happen fast. And someone preached the gospel to me. Someone shared the gospel with me. And I no more wanted the gospel than the man. I didn't want Jesus. I didn't want church. I didn't want religion. I didn't want anything about it. But I encountered someone who was willing to tell me. And then the Holy Spirit took over from there. Someone has got to be willing to say something to us. Someone's got to be willing to share. 